Mutual presents The Mysterious Traveler. This is the Mysterious Traveler, inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, that it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves, and be comfortable, if you can. Where are we going? Today we're going to delve into the strange story of a Chinese bell. A bell whose ringing is a summons for the dead to live and the living to die. As you shall see in the story I call... Death is the Judge. Our story begins in a small curio shop in New York's Chinatown. Dr. John Williams, one of the finest brain surgeons in the Middle West, and his wife are celebrating their 20th wedding anniversary by a trip to New York. They have stopped in at this curio shop for sentimental reasons, just as they did on their honeymoon 20 years before. Oh, John, it's the same. It's exactly the same as it was. (laughs) Doesn't look as if a thing had been sold since we were in here last. It certainly doesn't. If it wasn't that old Key Wong is dead now, I'd be tempted to believe we'd gone back 20 years when we came through the door. Even the smell of incense and ginger is the same. Mm. We must buy something, John, even if it's only a trinket, just for sentiment's sake. If you want a trinket, how about this statue of Buddha here, huh? It only weighs about three tons. Oh, silly. <laughs> but what about one of these bells, John? We need a dinner bell. How would this one do, hmm? Mm, that would be better for a temple gong, darling. Better try again. All right, John. Oh, I have it. This lovely little bell of rose crystal. Why, why it's the exact color of that rose crystal pendant old Ki Wong sold us on our honeymoon. The lady has found something that pleases her. Uh, yes, this crystal bell. How much is it? And please don't make the price too high. The price is not high, but the lady would not want it. But I do want it. Why should you think I wouldn't? Once it was a most unlucky bell. Now it is broken. My honored father, Ki Wong, broke it to break the evil fortune that followed it. Broken? Where? Looks all right to me. It is broken because it will not ring. The clapper is gone. That's right, Mary. The clapper is missing. But I could easily have a new clapper made. It is not possible. Only the clapper carved when this bell was carved out of the same block of rose crystal will make this bell ring. But that's ridiculous. I never heard of such a thing. Oh, we can test it easily enough. Suppose I tap it with this silver pencil. That ought to make it ring. I am happy to have you try. Huh. That's odd. It won't make anything but that dead sound. I'll bet I could make it ring. <laughs> You're welcome to try, my no, dear. No, I, I don't mean now. I mean once I got it home. When my honored father took out the clapper... He meant that this bell should never ring again, and it never will. But why, Sam Key? Because bell was stolen, and so carried evil fortune with it, and because it is a bell of life. It came from a temple in Tibet. Only lamas were permitted to lay hands on it. But obviously someone else did. That is why it is unlucky. When my father received it 20 years ago, he took out the clapper and disposed of it. I do not know where or to whom. But why? Just just what was he afraid of? He dare not risk having this bell ring, for it belonged to the High Lama of a tribe that believed the ringing of this bell will bring the dead back to life. What? You mean this bell? Yes, yes. You, you look skeptical. But it is true. When someone died whose life was too precious to spare, this sacred bell was rung beside his body, and death uh, uh, let go his hold. The dead returned to life. You mean you you really believe that? It is true. But I, I have not told the whole story. This carving here upon the bell, it is Tibetan, it says... Who rings this bell 
cheats death. But death will not be cheated. A little cryptic, I'd say. It means that when the bell is used to rescue someone from death, another whose span of life is not yet over is taken by death instead. You mean that the Grim Reaper keeps his quota filled even if he has to take somebody who's not on his list? It is so, Doctor. John, you're talking as if you believe the whole thing. It's, it's just nonsense, of course. <laughs> but what a lovely topic for conversation it'll make. Oh, I just simply won't leave without this bell now. But if it won't ring, what good is it? I'll make it ring. Leave that to me. If the lady wishes the bell, the price is $5. Well, the lady wants it, so she'd better have it, I guess. Oh, <coughs> I don't want to risk breaking it while we're traveling, though. Uh, can you mail it to our home address? Of course. The name is Dr. John Williams, 176. <laughs> And so, a week later, shortly after Dr. Williams and his wife had returned home, a small package reached them. As he unwrapped it, Dr. Williams' curiosity was stirred again, and in his study he tried once more to make the strange bell of rose crystal ring. Hmm, curious. It really won't ring, no matter what I tap it with. Hmm. John. Oh, hello, Mary. You're home from the hospital early, dear. Yes, I felt a little tired today. But look what just came in the mail. Oh, why, it's my crystal bell. Mm -hmm. Oh, John, it's lovely. I it's even more beautiful than I remembered it. Yes, but I'm afraid Sam Key was telling the truth when he said only the original clapper will make it ring. I've tried everything I can think of. <laughs> the trouble with men, darling, is that they're not logical. What do you mean? Well... If the ball is of rose crystal, a rose crystal clapper should make it ring, shouldn't it? The logic is perfect, but how can we test it? By using my rose crystal pendant, of course. I'm wearing it this afternoon so we can try it out right away. Here, see? Mm, now what? You hold the bell, and I'll tap it with a pendant. All right, tap away, but I bet it doesn't ring. You'll see. Now listen. There. What'd I tell you? It did ring. Of course it did. <laughs> I was sure it would, even if Sam Key's story was true. John, don't you see? Don't I see what? Well, my crystal pendant is the bell's missing clapper. The missing clapper? Mm -hmm. Good heavens, I almost believe you're right. Well, I am right. As soon as Sam Key told us how his father took the clapper out of the bell and sold it 20 years ago, mm -hmm. well, I was positive he'd made it into the pendant that he sold us 20 years ago. It should be impossible, but it certainly looks as if it must be true. After all these years, the bell and the clapper have come back together again. <laughs> you know, I knew there was something queer about that bell the minute I saw it. Queerest feeling came over me that I... I just must have it. I'm not sure that I like that thought, oh, Mary. silly. I know you half believe that story Sam Key told us. But I didn't. Now, I have my bell complete. Now, all I have to do is unfasten the pendant and attach it to the bell again. But, Mary... Now, help me do it, John. Look, the pendant's loose. It'll come off the chain if I twist it. Uh, yes, here it is. Mary, are you sure this is wise? Now, if I tie it inside the bell with this thread... Darling, please hold it so I can see what I'm doing. Uh, there. Now it's as good as new again. Listen. Mary, I... Uh, John. John, what is uh, it? I, I don't know. I, I don't feel well. Oh, you're tired, darling. Now, please sit down. Sit down here. I, I will. Well, I feel better now. It was just a moment's dizziness. You're working too hard at the hospital. That's what's the trouble. Well, maybe. I admit I had a strenuous day. I spent two hours on a brain operation. A splendid boy. He looked a lot like our David. But he'll be good for another 50 years now, with luck. Just the same. You must take it easier, John. Now, you sit still here while I fix you some spirits of ammonia, and then... Well, that's probably for me. Now, I'll you sit it. still. I'll answer. Hello? Yes, Dr. Williams is here. Who's calling, please? The hospital? Oh. Uh, yes, I'll tell him. Uh, goodbye. Mary, what's happened at the hospital? It's an emergency case, John, another brain operation. And, oh, darling, you are so tired. Can't be helped. I'm the only brain surgeon in town these days. Uh, help me get into my coat, will you? Uh, well, where's my hat? Oh, here you are, oh, dear. Thanks. Now let me straighten your tie. All right. There, you're ready. 
Now, I'm going to drive you over, and you can relax until we get there. All right, then, but let's get going. The almost five miles to the hospital. Nurse, another sponge, please. Here, Doctor. Dr. Williams, the pulse is very faint. The breathing has become dangerously weak. I'll have to try adrenaline. The hypodermic nurse. Uh, yes, Doctor. I'll get it ready. The patient has stopped breathing, Doctor. And there's no pulse. Quick with that adrenaline. We've got to get the pulse started again. Here, Doctor. Good. Yeah. That ought to start the heart action again. There's still no pulse, Doctor. We'll try artificial respiration. Yes, Doctor. Oxygen, nurse, quickly. Yes. Keep the pressure steady, nurse. Johnson, any pulse yet? Not yet, Doctor. The adrenaline doesn't seem to have taken effect. Well, it must. Nurse, give me more oxygen. I'm going to continue the artificial respiration as long as there's a single chance. <laughs> I'm afraid it's no use, Doctor. No sign of a pulse at all. Dr. Williams, please rest now. You've done everything that anyone could. But he hasn't shown a sign of life, not for half an hour. Yes, I'm afraid we're beaten. If anyone could have saved him, you'd have done it. But death had, well, too strong a grip on him for anyone to bring him back. Too strong a grip. Yes, I do rather feel as if I'd been wrestling with someone for this poor fellow's life. And lost. Well, Doctor, don't feel too badly. In room eight, there's a boy who has a full life ahead of him, thanks to you. I suppose I have to look at it that way. Now, help me off with these things, will you, nurse? Of course, Doctor. There's the gloves and the jacket. Now, what did I do with my coat? I just threw it down somewhere when I arrived here. I was in such a hurry. I've got it, Doctor. Let me help you. Oh, thanks, Johnson. <laughs> what the deuce have I got in this pocket? That bell, I must have jammed it into my coat without thinking in the rush to get here. Oh, look out, catch it! Oh, I have it. Ooh, that was close. <laughs> Might have smashed on the floor. Here you are, Dr. Thanks. I almost wish it had broken, though. For some reason, I hate the sound of it. But my wife... Dr. Williams. Uh, yes, nurse? The patient. The color's coming back in his face, and, and I can feel a pulse now. What? Now, let me see. Yes, you're right. His heart's beating again. Look. He's beginning to breathe. Quick, start the oxygen yes, again. I'm going to give him an injection of plasma. Make the preparation, please, Johnson. Yes, Dr. Williams. How is the pulse now, nurse? It's getting stronger, Doctor. And his respiration is gaining, too. Yes, Doctor. What? I've never seen anything like it. It's almost a miracle. Now, where's that plasma? Here, Doctor. I have everything ready. Good. Nurse, disinfect the arm, please. Right away, Dr. Williams. Oh, here comes Dr. Bronson. How's it going, Williams? Been having trouble? Oh, hello, Bronson. Yes, a little trouble, but I think we're in the clear now. For a while, I thought the patient was gone, but now he's going to pull through, I'm sure of it. Good. Doctor, I'm afraid I have bad news for you about your other patient, though. What do you mean? The boy in room eight, the one you operated on this afternoon. Yeah? He died suddenly just a couple of minutes ago. Just went like that for no reason at all. Dr. Williams' second patient, who had come back seemingly from death itself, did live. But when the operation was over and Dr. Williams was driving back to his home with his wife, he was strangely silent and preoccupied, so that when his wife spoke to him, he, he did not seem to hear her. Don't you want me to drive, John? John, I'm speaking to you. Oh, uh, oh, what, Mary? I said, don't you want me to drive? Oh, no, thanks, Mary. I'm perfectly all right. It's just that I was thinking. About that operation? Yes, the nurse told me about it. It was wonderful that you saved him. That's just it. I didn't save him. He was dead. Dead, do you hear? Then for no reason whatever, he came back to life. But you injected adrenaline and... I injected uh... adrenaline half an hour before he showed signs of life. Then he revived. For no apparent reason whatever. Well, perhaps the adrenaline took a delayed effect. Perhaps. But there was no more reason for it than there was for the boy in room eight to die suddenly as he did. 
But you have said yourself, John, that in medicine, nothing is ever absolutely certain. That's true, but just the same, that boy's sudden death bothers me. I want to know why he died. Well, an autopsy would tell you, wouldn't it? An autopsy? Yes. Mary, I'm going to turn around and go back to the hospital right now. I'm going to perform that autopsy myself. But, John, you mustn't turn here. There's too much traffic oh, here. Oh, there's nothing coming now. I'll just swing around. John! John, look out! That car coming around the curb! Look out! <laughs> Stand back, all of you. Come on, get back. Now, lady, drink this. It'll make you feel better. Oh, thank you, officer. You were in an accident and knocked out for a couple of minutes. Lips are coming around all right. Just drink this and lie quiet. An accident? Yes. My husband, where is he? I'm sorry, ma'am. Oh, he's hurt. Where is he? I, I, I must go to him. Uh, he's right here, ma'am. When I come along on my motorcycle after it happened, I pulled you both out. But he wasn't breathing. John. John, speak to me. It's no use, ma'am. I'm afraid he's gone. Oh, John. John. Come on, get back, all of you. Get back, I say. Now, oh, ma'am, the ambulance will be here in a minute. If there's anything to be done, they'll do it. There's nothing. I've been a doctor's wife long enough not to know death when I see it. Just let me sit here where I can see him. I know how you feel, ma'am, and I hate to bother you. But if you could just tell me how it happened for my report. You see, the other driver says... It wasn't my fault. I couldn't help it. He pulled right out in front of me. He didn't even signal. I... Now, take he it easy, gonna... mister. Or you'll make that bump on your head worse. Officer, where's my bag? There's some smelling salts in it. I, I feel faint. Well, here's your bag. I took care of it. Thank you. I feel better in a minute. And here's something that was in the bag, ma'am. Fell out, and I put it in my pocket. Uh, it's a bell. I'll put it in your bag if you like. Mary. Thank you so much. Oh, Mary. All right. John. John. Was that a bell ringing? It seemed so, so loud and clear, like an alarm waking me up. What's happened, Mary? It was an accident, John. But you're all right. You're all right. An accident? Are you hurt? No, John, no. no please, please lie still. Hey, he's trying to sit up. And only a moment ago, he was dead. Gee, I'm glad he's okay, even though the accident wasn't my fault. Hey, mister, I'll, I'll give you a hand. I... Uh, officer... Officer, I... What's wrong? I told you to be careful. You got quite a bump on the head. Yes, I feel... I feel so... Wait, so dizzy. Oh, he's keeled over. Where are those smelling salts? Here, let me look at him. Oh, I'm John. a doctor. John, you shouldn't exert yourself. Oh, please, Mary. How is he, Doc? This man is dead. Though Dr. Wilson protested that his injuries were not serious, he returned to the hospital where Dr. Bronson treated him finding nothing wrong save a slight concussion. His wife took him home in a taxi cab, promising to see that he stayed in bed for a day or two. That night, however, neither Dr. Williams nor his wife could sleep, though they remained awake for uh, different reasons. Ten, eleven, twelve. Mary, is that you? I... I was counting the strokes. It's midnight. You should be asleep. <laughs> Can't go to sleep. Not until David gets home. David? Where is he? The movie? No. He came to me this afternoon and said there was a party at his fraternity tonight. He asked me if he could borrow the old car for the evening, and I let him have it. But he's not back yet, John. I can't help worrying. Especially after what happened to us. Well, I'll give him a talking to in the morning. A boy of 17 isn't old enough to be out until all hours. You ought to be asleep yourself, John. How's your head? It's all right. Just throbs a little. All I had was a slight concussion. John, are you sure? Of course I am. Didn't you hear Bronson say so? What are you getting at? The bell. The crystal bell. Well, what about the bell? Your first words were about hearing it ring like an alarm wakening you. 
And it, it had just rung. Well, what of it? It rang, and I heard it as I was regaining consciousness. But at the hospital, the bell rang in the operating room, and your patient came back to life. He, he heard the bell ring, too. Oh, don't be silly, Mary. My patient revived for natural reasons. As for me, I was just knocked out. And, but both times, somebody else died, John. At the hospital, the boy in room eight. And after you returned, the driver in the other car died. Pure coincidence. The boy probably had a blood clot on his heart. The driver had a fractured skull. It's a common occurrence for men with fractured skulls to keel over without even realizing they're hurt. But Sam Key told us that when the bell rang, the dead would return to life. And someone living would die. Oh, stuff and nonsense, Mary. You've been a doctor's wife long enough to know that such thing isn't possible. But, John, I... No, no buts about it. It's impossible, do you hear? Yes, John. Of course it's impossible. Oh, I do wish David would get home. I feel so uneasy about him. He'll be home any minute now. He knows that he's supposed to... Oh, it's the telephone. Well, I'll answer. No. No, let me... No, stay in bed. I'll answer. Oh, all right, John. It'll only be a moment. Hello, Dr. Williams speaking. Uh, the police? What is it? What's happened? An accident. My son... Where is he? Is he badly hurt? The car turned over and burned. And my son? I see. The Rockford Village Morgue. Yes, I'll come at once. John, what was it? Mary, I, I told you to stay in bed. It was just an emergency call. It's David, isn't it? Yes, it is David. I can tell by your face. Where is he? What's happened to him? He's been in an accident, Mary. He... David is dead. Is that it, John? Yes, Mary. Take me to him. Oh, John, you've got to take me to him. <laughs> place, mister. The Rockford Village Morgue. Cross the pavement, go down those steps, then along the walk to where you see that little light over the door. Well, thank you. Mary, you must wait in the cab for me. I want to come with you. Now, you mustn't. Promise me you'll wait here. I want to come with you. I want to see my son. Not yet. Promise you'll wait for me. Oh, all right, John. I'll wait. Be careful of those steps, mister. They're pretty steep and it's awful dark. I'll be careful. I'll only be five minutes or so, Mary. your husband back now, ma'am. John. Oh, John. Was it David? Please get back in the cab. Now. No, John, I must know. Was it David? Yes, Mary, it, it was David. Oh, I have to go to him. Mary, stop. No, let go of me. I'm going to David. Mary, stop struggling. You can't go to I him. must. I, I must. Mary, don't you understand? You mustn't see him. I'm going, John. What have you got in your hand? It's the bell, the crystal bell. What are you doing with it? Here, give it to me. No, I'm going to ring it. Oh, give me that bell. No, I won't. I'm going to ring it, I tell you. There. There, I've rung it. I've rung it. David. David, did you hear? Mary, you're out of your mind. I'm not. I know what I'm doing. David. Can you hear me? Now give me that bell. There. In heaven's name, what are you trying to do? It brought back your patient. It brought you back. And it'll bring back my son. Mary, come to your senses. It's just a bell. It's not. I know it's not. You were dead. And I saw it bring you back to life. You mustn't believe that. And even if the bell were more than a bell. Don't you understand? The car turned over and burned. I had to identify David by his fraternity ring. And the driver's license in his wallet. I don't care. He's my son. David! David! Mary, get into the cab. I won't. Not until I have my son back. David! Mary, won't you please? Mother! Mother! John, listen. It's David. Mother! David. Mother! Dad! Where are you? John, let go of me. It's David. 
but he can't find us. I've got to go to him. Mary, don't you understand? He was burned, burned horribly. Mary, Dad! Where are you? Mary. Let go of me. He's my son, and I'm going to him. David! David! Mary, come back. Mary, don't go down those steps to the morgue. David! David! Mary, come back. Come back. Hey, mister, watch yourself. Look out for them steps. Mary! Mary! Oh! Mister, look out! Mister, are you hurt? Okay, she fell all the way down the steps. Mister, are you all right? Here, let me help you. Dad! Dad, here I am. I'm all right. I wasn't in the car at all. It was one of my fraternity brothers. I lent him my driver's license and... Dad. Dad, what is it? What's wrong? He started this way and fell down these steps. But... Why is he so still? Dad. Dad, speak to him. John. John, speak to us. David's all right, do you hear? David's come back to us. He's come back from the dead. He doesn't answer. He isn't breathing. David. He's dead. Yeah, lady. I guess he is. You see this glass bell he was holding? When he fell down, it broke. Looks like one of the pieces of it went straight into his heart. The bell killed him. Dr. Williams was dead, but his son is alive and well, even today. Although it wasn't because the bell rang. Of course not. Anyhow, the bell is broken, so there's no way of proving whether or not it had strange powers of life and death. Or whether it was just a coincidence that each time it rang, one of the dead lived and the living died. But if I were you, I'd certainly play safe if you hear a bell ringing tonight don't answer it. It might be ringing. Oh, you have to get off here. I'm sorry. But I'm sure we'll meet again. I take this same train each week at this time. have just heard The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and terrifying. In tonight's cast were Maurice Toplin, Cameron Prudholm, Eleanor Phelps, Donald Buker, Juan Hernandez, and Mort Lawrence. Original music was played by Charles Paul. The Mysterious Traveler is written, produced, and directed by Bob Arthur and David Cogan. Listen next week to a tale titled, Meet Me at the Morgue, another strange and shivery tale of the mysterious traveler. The mysterious traveler has come to you from our New York studios. Ralph Paul speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.